Hello, welcome to this lesson on electron excitation. This is a second version of this lesson. This version will focus on Bohr configurations with respect to electron excitation. With that, let's get rolling. Today's question of the day. Niels Bohr said that electrons can move around inside of an atom. So if the electrons are attracted to the nucleus, why would those electrons ever move away from the nucleus? Depending on which model of the atom you're talking about, electrons live in different places. And that doesn't mean they actually live in different places. I say live, they're not even alive. They're located in different places. It's just how we refer to them is different. So in the Bohr model, he refers to them as energy levels. We often refer to them as shells. In the modern model, this area is referred to as electron clouds. They still are all referencing the same area, which is roughly outside of the nucleus. We know that the nucleus is positive and electrons are negative. So the nucleus should be attracting electrons, which is going to pull electrons in close to the nucleus. But at the same time that that's happening, electrons are going to repel other electrons. So they can all just funnel into the nucleus because they kind of repel each other on their way, attracting to the nucleus, right? So between this attraction between the nucleus and electrons and the electron-electron repulsions, electrons will fill the atom in a very specific way. More on that in the electron configuration lesson, which is part of um, unit three on the periodic table, because the periodic table really is the key to electron configuration. They really go hand in hand. Um, but you know from the Bohr models lesson that in each energy level of an atom, only a certain number of electrons will fit. And that's also based on the periodic table. Um, so within this organization of electrons, every single electron has a specific place inside of the atom. So if it's in the first level, it will be assigned to the first level. It mostly hangs out in that first level. That's its home base, we'll say. If we have electrons in the second level, they mostly live in the second level with just a few exceptions um, of them being able to move around, which is what we're learning today. So I have kind of formulated all of this into an analogy because it's actually kind of tough to understand. But when we think about it in this silly quantum estates, I find that my students learn it a little bit better. So welcome to quantum estates, which is an apartment building where the elevator shaft exists, but there's no power. The elevator hasn't been installed yet. Uh, so when electrons are choosing which room they want to live in inside of quantum estates, they are going to have to climb the stairs. Okay, so we're going to kind of roll with this analogy, it'll make a little bit more sense as we go on. So we have an apartment building, which is called quantum estates, and it is the home to electrons in an atom of any element. It's a hypothetical thing. So this apartment building may represent an atom of neon or an atom of silver or of chromium. Doesn't matter. It represents an atom. The electrons want to live inside the atom, right? So inside of this building, the elevator was never installed. So the electrons have to climb up the stairs, you know, a four story walk up if they live in the fourth energy level. So in this analogy, the building represents any atom. It's just one atom, but it could be any atom. The lobby is going to represent the nucleus and each floor is going to represent a principal energy level. Now, if you don't remember from the Bohr models lesson, based on the periodic table, which has seven periods, it looks like there's nine, but this, remember six and seven repeat on the bottom, six and seven, the principal energy levels, each of those is going to be a floor of the building. This very first electron is going to move in and he's very excited about it. So out of all of the available floors, where will this first electron choose to live? And he says, remember, my charge is negative. He's going to choose to live on the first floor because he's a little lazy and he doesn't want to have to climb all those stairs. The truth of the matter is that electrons are always going to choose the lowest energy state possible, which means they want to be as close to the nucleus as possible. And the reason for this is called the Aufbau principle. It is because 
the nucleus is overall positive, right? It's made of positive protons and neutral neutrons, and electrons are negative. So the positive negative sort of combination there, the electrons want to get as close to the nucleus as possible. Now, if we have a second electron, where would the second electron want to live? The second electron will also choose to live on the first floor because the Aufbau principle says that the electrons will choose to be as close to the nucleus whenever that is possible. Because again, positive nucleus and negative electrons are going to be attracted to each other. Now, if you don't remember from the Bohr models lesson, only two electrons fit in that first energy level. Too many electrons and it, it breaks open because they repel each other, right? So the next set of electrons are going to move into the second energy level. This will be electrons three through 10. So that's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. That's eight electrons in total. Now, if you remember back from the Bohr lesson, the Bohr models lesson, if you count the number of elements across period two on the periodic table, there's eight. You have lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. That's eight. Eight electrons will fit in that second energy level. Only eight will fit because anything more than that, and there's too much repulsion going on between the electrons. It's just based on the size of the second energy level. Too many electrons and it just won't work. Now in higher level chemistry, we do talk about how principal energy levels can be organized themselves, which can get really crazy. Um, so we're not going to get into that right now. You can see that in the alternative version of this lesson. Um, but here's how it goes. Electrons will always try to get as far away from each other as possible, but they want to be close to the nucleus. So two rules are going to decide where electrons fit inside of an atom. We've already done the Aufbau principle, which means electrons want to get as close to the nucleus as possible. But we also have a rule called Hund's rule, which is that electrons want to be as far away from each other as possible. And this should be reflected in any of your drawings. All right, so we have our electrons one through 10. We have two in the first level and eight in the second level. And now they're all moved in. They're going to have a party. This is so exciting. So the electrons have gotten comfortable in their low energy homes and it's time for a party upstairs. There's a party going on upstairs. In order to get upstairs, the electrons are going to have to drink a Red Bull. They got to get some energy. It's a late night party. Everybody just moved in, exhausted from, you know, carrying all these boxes in and moving in and unpacking. So they're going to drink a Red Bull to get some wings and fly up. I know this is really cheesy, but it definitely helps. All right, so in reality, the electrons are absorbing energy. They're still getting energy. They're not drinking Red Bull because they're not living things. They're getting energy from absorbing either heat energy or electricity. So in this first case, we have a lithium flame test. Right here, um, let me get my pen. Right here, I have a little chunk of lithium chloride. And that lithium chloride absorbs the heat energy from the Bunsen burner flame. And that's what happens. You get this, this cool situation of this pink magenta flame. Now, the second option here is that this is a, a gas inside of a tube. Think of it kind of like neon lights, like an open sign in a, a storefront, maybe in a pizza shop, fresh pizza. <laughs> um, so you have a gas inside of this tube. They're not always neon, but neon is a common one, which is how they got the term neon light. In this case, it's hydrogen gas inside of a tube and it's being fed electricity and then it's going to light up. Now it's a coincidence that both of these are you know, bright pink, they light up in all different kinds of colors, but that depends on the specific element. As the atom absorbs energy, either in the form of heat or electricity, one or two electrons typically are going to have enough energy to literally jump up to a higher energy level. There may or may not be electrons in this energy level. Sometimes there is, sometimes there is not. Um, get enough energy, drink enough Red Bull, go up and have a party. Now, in this case, we're looking at two different situations of aluminum. I know this is aluminum because we have a plus 13 written for the nucleus, which means there's 13 protons in there. Any atom with 13 protons is aluminum. So 
at first we're looking at a, an aluminum atom. And I know this is an aluminum atom because 2 plus 8 plus 3 is giving me a total of 13 electrons. So if I have um, 13 protons and 13 electrons, this is an atom of aluminum. It's electrically neutral. What happened to aluminum is that this electron here that's highlighted in blue absorbed enough energy that it was able to overcome the charge of the nucleus, overcome that attraction, and jump up to a higher energy level. And you can see that, number one in the picture, but also number two in the electron configuration, which is listed down here. The electron configuration is just telling you how the electrons are organized inside of the atom. So in this case, we have two in the first energy level, one and two. Then we have eight in the second and three in the last. If you were to draw a Bohr diagram for aluminum, it should look just like this. Now over here, we have the electron has gained enough energy. It's missing from its spot right here, and it has jumped up to the third energy level. Now, the low energy state for aluminum is called the ground state. That is how aluminum exists 99.99999% of the time. The aluminum foil in your kitchen drawer is in the ground state. When this aluminum has enough energy and it's a lot of energy, you need a lot of energy for this to happen. When that electron is able to jump up, we call it the excited state. Think like having a party, you're excited for this party. The electron jumps up. The energy absorbed has to be a specific amount. And Bohr called that a quanta or a quantum. This is the idea of the quantum leap. Um, it takes a lot of energy for it to happen. It's moving a very small distance, but the attraction of positive and negative is very difficult to overcome, especially when you have 13 protons holding on to that single electron saying, don't go anywhere. And then it has enough energy to pop up into a higher energy level. Now, something I want you to notice about the configurations, two plus eight plus three is 13, two plus seven plus four, Four is also 13. The number of electrons did not change. It's just the fact that their organization has changed for a brief amount of time. Here you are. The total number of electrons remains the same. Unfilled energy level, the seven here, is an indicator that you're looking at an excited state atom. Remember the alpha principle? Electrons want to get as close to the nucleus as possible. Well, the fact that we have an empty space in the second energy level, right? It's supposed to hold eight, but in this case here, it's only holding seven. That tells me something's wrong here. It must be excited because this is not a normal state for aluminum to be in. The amount of energy that that aluminum atom has is not sustainable. You can't keep that amount of energy for a long time. Eventually the nucleus goes, give me that. And it grabs onto that electron and pulls it back to the second energy level where it's supposed to be. This is the electrons exhausting all of their energy and having to go back to where they live, the ground state. Now, in the real world, outside of this analogy, really what happens is that the electrons are going to emit energy in the form of light. Now, there's four different ways that I've described this because <laughs> emit is probably a new word. Emit, expel, spit out, or release energy in the form of light you can see that this light is being emitted here. In the lithium flame test, we have a bright pink flame. Fire is just heat and light at the same time. Um, so that light energy happens to be pink. And the same with the hydrogen spectral tube, that hydrogen gas inside the tube is being fed electrical energy. And when the electrons are releasing all of that electrical energy that they had absorbed, they're releasing it back in the form of light. So just think of it like an energy conversion. In the first case, heat goes in, light comes out. In the second case, electricity goes in and light comes out. The energy that the electron spits out is equal to the amount that it had absorbed. Now there is a science or a branch of science where all the scientist does is observe light and study light and measure light, and that is called spectroscopy. So you can see here, we have 
uh, some absorption here, the matter, the lithium or the hydrogen gas or the aluminum is going to absorb some amount of energy. It's initially in the ground state. It gets kicked up to the excited state once it absorbs just the right amount of energy to kick an electron up to a high energy level. Then the nucleus is going to say, enough of that, give me my electron back. <laughs> and the electron will have to give out that, it has, to, it has to get rid of that energy in order to go back to the ground state. It's a low energy state. That's where it belongs. That's where positive and negative exist in harmony. So when the electron leaves excited state and returns to ground state, that energy has to be emitted or released. And in this case, it'll become uh, light. And specifically in chemistry, we're talking about colored light, which makes it extra fun. When that happens, we have left excited state and returned to ground state. So here are some examples of flame tests. Uh, if you take zinc and you excite it, it will feed back yellow light. Potassium has this beautiful pale purple. Strontium is a very rich fire truck red. Sodium is a kind of boring. It's a typical orange color. And copper is one of my favorites, although that copper, in my experience, is a little bit more blue than that. It's like an awesome blue-green color. Um, but this still is, is a beautiful flame test regardless. Now, when scientists are practicing or doing spectroscopy, they're going to measure the wavelength of this light. Now, the amount and the wavelengths are unique for each element. Like I was saying, strontium has a specific colored light, and that is measurable based on its wavelength. Um, so this, because it's unique, some people will call it the fingerprint of the element. So on the bottom, on the right, we have the hydrogen absorption spectrum, which means that hydrogen is going to absorb all of that rainbow light from the purple all the way to the red. It's absorbing all of that, but it will emit two purple wavelengths, a blue wavelength and a red wavelength. Now, if you were in art class and you were going to mix two shades of purple and blue and red together, what would you get? You'd probably get this purpley pink color that you see right here, right? Yeah, this typically is going to be a combination of all of the wavelengths. So if we go and again, look at that strontium, I don't know what strontium's wavelengths are that it emits, but I would assume that it is a lot of red, maybe a little tinge of purple, maybe some orange. I'm not quite sure, but in totality, it's going to mostly be red lines. For sodium, it could be a mix of red and yellow. It could also just be orange wavelengths, but any which way, all of the sodium wavelengths together visibly are going to come off as orange to our eyes. This is why scientists choose to measure the wavelength of the light, because you can get far more specific data. For hydrogen, instead of saying purple, you could say we have a wavelength at like 402 and 430 three and you have another one at four eighty two and six fifty five and there you go then you can measure it more electrons you have the crazier the emission spectrum is now using this in practical purposes we have used this to identify the composition of the atmospheres and stars very, very far away, places that we wouldn't be able to visit just because they're too far away to get to. Um, this is actually how we discovered helium. Helium was discovered on the sun, not on Earth. It's the only element, as far as I know, that was discovered not on Earth. This here is a spectroscope. This is just like a cheapy $10 one for students, but you kind of use it like a telescope and inside it has these measurements and it has space for the lines to come through and when you do this in an astronomy lab it's far better see i i have white lights pointing at me right now and when i look through i just see a rainbow spectrum in my measurements because white light is a combination of everything i have red lights on now it's a little bit ominous it's actually like rainy outside today um, so there's a little interference, but not too much. My wavelength that I'm getting, I'm not reading this perfectly. Let me try this one over here. The wavelength I'm getting is about 640, which if you look, 640 should be 
right about here-ish. It's an orangey red. Let me see. Here's green. So green, if I have green light on, it's hard for you to tell. I, I don't look quite like Shrek. Um, I should hit like 530-ish. So I'm going to try it with my spectroscope. I am. I'm getting, I'm getting a green line right at 530. So um, that is what you're going to read on an emission spectrum. And that will tell you, there we go. Here I am. That'll, that'll tell you what you're looking at um, in terms of the emission. Now we have emission spectrums for basically all of the elements at this point. I shouldn't say all of them for a lot of them um, because it's been studying this for a long time. So the way scientists use this is they'll like point the very, very, very fancy expensive spectroscope into space, looking at the atmosphere of some planet, and they're able to tell you that it's full of methane or sulfur. Helium, like I was saying, helium was discovered not on Earth. They pointed a big fancy spectroscope at the sun, and they were like, that's hydrogen, and that's carbon, and that's lithium, and what is that? That must be a new element. And then they decided, oh, we're going to name it helium, right? Like heliocentric theory or um, Helios, the Greek god of the sun, Roman god of the sun. Forgive me. Uh, that's why helium has the name helium, like the sun, because it was discovered on the sun. And then a number of years later, they found helium on earth and they were, oh, that's the same thing. And it was like a really cool thing. So that is how we use spectroscopy in reality. Um, we can also use this flame test concept to make fireworks. So if you have uh, red fireworks, 4th of July, a lot of the time that is an explosion with gunpowder and strontium. And because it's a heck of a lot of energy going on, you're able to excite the strontium and turn it red. And then eventually as it cools in the sky and the explosion ends, basically, um, it loses the energy and then it just and then it's just kind of dust. <laughs> so again, um, when you are looking for excited state, when you're reading configurations, you're looking for an empty or an unfilled shell or energy level, because that's going to tell you that the electrons are not behaving the way that they should. They are not following the alpha principle, getting as close to the nucleus as possible. Um, the excited state is a temporary state. They will eventually lose energy and have to go back to ground state. And I'm going to reiterate one more time before we go. Electrons live in the ground state 99.999% of the time. They are given a specific amount of energy. They are able to jump to higher energy levels, typically just one or two of them at a time. When they return to the ground state is when they emit energy in the form of light. And that light can be read as colored light to our eyeballs, but with tools, we can figure out the specific wavelength. With those wavelengths, we can distinguish elements from each other. All right. I know that was a long one. Thanks for sticking with me. I hope to see you in the next lesson. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. Of course, if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.